I knew that I wanted to produce and direct live shows. I knew that I wanted to produce things for television. I also knew that I loved events coordination, whether it's setting up a party at the dojo on PP, setting up a, a house party. When people are like, what are the underground fights? Bro, we were fucking renting out villas and we used to throw fights in villas, dude. I, like, I'm the real bad guy. I'm real Mr. Hong. <laughs> Okay, welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan. Fruiting Body is a medicinal mushroom company located on the island of Phuket. Today, we have an absolute legend of a guest. Long-term veteran of Thailand, Phuket, co -PP. This is John Nutt, owner, founder of Full, 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 full Metal Dojo. Exactly. Let's get this started. Uh, John, thanks a lot for joining Thank us. You. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Fun times, finally. Finally, yeah. yeah. it has been a long time. Yeah, because... Uh, I guess we can explain a bit how we quickly connected. It was through sure. Callum, and he said, hey, I was looking to do this uh, fight event, again, bored during the yes. current situation lockdown. And we got connected, I think, uh, pretty much right when shit went down. It was, yeah, it was 2020. Yeah. So, um, and, and yeah, we were doing this, uh, I think it was, at, what's it called, that bar down there? Uh, reggae bar or uh, jam, jam Rock? Jam Rock. Yeah, we did Good the old Jam Rock. Yeah, we did that event down yeah. there. Um, that guy's at my place. Well, I just gave really? him a canvas, by the way. I just, Did gave, you? I just gave him the canvas from our bare knuckle show yeah. uh, to put up in his new, because he's got a new jam rock up in Caron. Okay. at the top of the mountain, and it's ridiculous. He made a boat on the top of the mountain. I'm talking about Dreddy. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so he's up there. He's got a, this big boat. He wants to have fights up there and, like, do weird stuff, but obviously it's, like, very off the beaten path, and you have to travel up a hill, and it's... Yeah, similar even, to it's it's harder to get to than Jamrock is. Yeah, because the Jamrock one, we were afraid to bring a. We had a four tuner, and we're like, I'm not going down there. I'm not going down there. Fuck that. Yeah, but it's crazy. You watch them; they're just ripping up and down, left of and right. Of course, like w those tires, it's wide enough that if you went left or right, I swear by inches, you're yeah. going off the mountain. He was asking me to do a fight at Jamrock in like 2016, and I remember being like, "Well, the biggest issue is an ambulance," and he was like, "Why do you need an ambulance?" And I was like. For the fights, and he was like, "Oh, that's 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 peculiar." And I was like, "Yeah, not really, you know." Uh, <laughs> so we wound up obviously not yeah. doing it there. But I've done some in some weird places, and I've thought of obviously doing it at Jamrock. And his new place is kind of kind of wild, but yeah. yeah even for us, we I was doing it with Eddie Farrell again. Mm -hmm. Just did it for fun, but yep. uh, uh, the ambulance had to wait up there. And I asked Eddie, "I'm like, what if this guy, like, someone gets serious seriously injured?" He's like. Yeah, they all kind of know each other. We'll yeah. be we'll be okay. We'll be fine. Yeah, it's you know it's just that Thai style. Like no, no wonder you got a hundred fights. Type exactly. Of thing. Um, so let's take this back in John's story. That's kind of what we do on this podcast. We want to understand the journey without that hippy dippy bullshit. Sure. What you do before Phuket? Thai, well, what you do before Thailand? What brought you here? And what's next? And what's going on? Type of thing. So let's start off with John Nutt back in the U.S. of A. Yeah. As a young John Nutt, where'd you grow up? And tell us your story. I grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts. I'm Repping, repping Marblehead right now. Uh, Maddie's Sail Loft, small sailor town. I don't know if you know it, but because uh, you're, you know, okay, yep. Toronto, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, so grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. Um, went to a place called Tabor Academy, then went to Trinity, uh, a very smart school, small Ivy, and did not enjoy it and left after about a year and a half, two years, and moved out to Los Angeles. Um, was working security in 2000 in Los Angeles, and 9-11 happened, which obviously 9-11 wasn't very... I have a lot of, like, the, the messed up times in the world have all done very weir very well for me in some weird ways, but when 9-11 happened, I was working with a couple different security groups, and after 9-11 happened, security groups in Los Angeles kind of took off, right? Everybody was first responding, if you will. So I, I worked a bunch of different security gigs... Some typical, like at bars and clubs. Some not so typical, working for like a company called Prometa. It's helping out with addicts and, and bringing them out of their places, like the movie Traffic. So I was going into like buildings and being like, reading off of a script. Hello, my name is Jonathan Nutt. I'm a friend of Dr. Matthew Torrington and our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, does anybody want to go to McDonald's? In and out? Can I offer you a burger? And then put them into an ambulance as soon as they get outside. You know what I mean? So um, Lure, Luring was, them in with Oh, that. of course, with yeah. food. 
Junkies love food. Because it's such an epidemic at that. It still is. I mean, it is. It is. It's not what it is now. I mean, Venice Beach back then was probably pristine compared to what Tent City it is now. But yeah, so I did a bunch of security through doing security. Um, I was working with different guys that were fighters um, and very, very into it. Like, I mean, I worked at a place called The Hack, the H A C, the Hollywood Athletic Club on Sunset. And at that time, our head of security was a guy named Shane and Robert Grant, Shane Eitner, Robert Grant. And, like, also on the security crew was, like, Frank Trigg, UFC Hall of Famer, who, like, was famous for all of his bouts against uh, Matt Hughes. Um, John Marsh, who fought in Pride, uh, also fought in the UFC. Mac Danzig, he was the smallest guy, so he, like, worked the back door and also had to deal with the most fights. But, like, so I had a lot of connections to... You know, shoot a box had just opened up in in Los Angeles. The bomb squad was still there, so like Rob Kamen was there. Like a lot, a lot was going on. I mean, again, this is pre the Ultimate Fighter television show. This is still technically when the UFC is struggling, right? They weren't making it, um, and but at that time, I was really getting into it. I also was really getting into. So I was doing a lot of kung fu with a guy named Clyde Ince at the time, and. The security guys would all do like MMA and technically more. Real. But it, it wasn't really real. MMA at that. Point. It wasn't, man. They were calling it an NHB back then. You know, what did that stand for? No holds barred. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like, <laughs> Soccer kicks to the oh, head. Of course. Know? Of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, did a bunch of those type of uh, King of the Cage was was kind of the big one still back then in Southern California. And um, but John Marsh, you know, he got me into boxing. He got me into like Muay Thai. And then we actually did know. I knew certain people back in Boston that worked with Delagrati. Mm-hmm. I knew certain people that were working with like the Lozons and the Kenny Florians of the world. Um, and so I had a bunch of people that were like, let's go out to Thailand. Let's go out to Thailand. Um, actually, just for, for a, like a fun story. And what, gr- what year are we looking at around now? 2003. 2003. 2004. Here, once, can you turn my headphones down a little, little bit? to control we got a we got this dog we're waiting for a to come back to take her off my lap otherwise she might jump <laughs> down the stairs so anyways Bugs. um so yeah continue so 2003 yeah, 2003 2004 um man so a uh, bunch of the guys that i worked with worked for like uh dr dre and eminem uh the game 50 cent so like i did a bunch of music videos for those guys like back then um it, it sounds a lot cooler than when i you know what i mean yeah. like it sounds a lot cooler than it actually is um, but the guys that I were, were, was working for, they were all going to work the vibe music awards. And this is just a, like a fun Googleable one for your, for the audience, if you will. Yep. But in 2004, the vibe music awards went down and my, the, the, the security group that I was all kind of a part of, they were working for Dr. Dre and Dr. Dre was receiving like a, I don't know if it was a lifetime or what, it, what he was technically receiving, but he was walking down and, uh, some dude stood up in the middle of the aisle and and popped him and there was like a riot at the vibe music awards and one of the guys from um from 50 cents crew what was that remember when it was yeah yeah uh, G unit G unit G unit yeah. so it was like uh, not Tony Ayo and not the uh, not Lloyd Banks but the other guy like shanked somebody down and we all wound up getting removed uh, no more no more job and so everybody was like uh, what are you going to do and at that time my brother had just gotten married he was going out to his uh to do his honeymoon on Koh Samui I had a friend that was going to backpack to uh, to Kopi P, and so I decided to jump on. So I came here late October of 2004. It was okay. my first trip. So literally right before the tsunami. Yeah. So, like, I came in, um, you know, did one night in Bangkok alone, then went down to Patea, and uh, I was hammered. I mean, like, I was hammered from getting off the plane. I was hammered. It was old Don Mung. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't uh, Sawanapum. And, um, yeah. Went down, I was going to go to Sit Yod Tong um, because we had Sit Yod Tong Boston and Sit Yod Tong there, and I knew some people that had went. And I I remember getting to Pattaya, and I hated it. Like, like, didn't like it at all. I remember walking down um, Walking Street there and being like, this place is filled with whores and just all the, the you know what I mean? I could shoot somebody right now. It's the typical, like, of what you think of Thailand would be coming from the West. For Americans especially. Right, yeah. Because that stuff stands out to us so much, you know what I mean? And it's it's crazy how your moral compass changes by, by living here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, we're just, you know, we're, we're used to it now. It's, yeah, of course. It's, sensi- it's just desensitized. It is. It is, 100%. So 
Yeah, so I um, then went back and met my buddy Mike, and we went backpacking. Same thing, though. Came down to Phuket, uh, and everybody pushed us to go to Bangla Road. Didn't really like Bangla Road. Wasn't my style. Um, and then they were like, well, just go to Kopi P. And I remember the moment that I got to Kopi P being like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to stay here forever. This is the best. Love it. I, I, you know, I have old videos of me that, you know, with a video camera that actually had cassettes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Taking videos on, uh, there. And yeah, those video camera, they're, they're, they're like, yeah, cassettes back oh, yeah. in the day. I remember I used you know to. What I'm talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. The DVs. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just, you know. I had broken up with a girlfriend. My parents were getting divorced. I, had, I was probably doing one of the first. So I had done a lot of travel. Like as an American, I don't think Americans travel very, very often. But my, my brother had gotten me into traveling. My parents got me into traveling. I had done a lot of Europe. I had done a lot of Mexico, Central America, uh, but hadn't done Asia. And um, came over here, thought I was going to do Muay Thai the entire time. Probably did Muay Thai for a week. Um, and the rest of the time I was on Kopi P and... Cliff jumping, spear fishing, doing adventures, uh, and going going to the different ones. Did Lanta, did Krabi, did Riley, and my buddy left uh, in the mid of mid of December. And I, my parents had gotten divorced, and I was like, I'm gonna stay for Christmas. My mother, I was talking to her, and she was like, You're a horrible, horrible son if you don't come home for Christmas. So I was like, uh, We'll book my ticket, and um, she helped me out, and I flew home to Los Angeles. I left Kopi P on the 23rd or 24th. Shit. Yeah, and then I flew home, and when I was in the air, the tsunami happened. And when I had actually gotten to LAX, my dad and my mom, who were split, they were both there, and brother was there, and we were going to do Christmas on the West Coast. My brother was in San Diego at the time, and and they were just like, "Yeah, you just missed, you know, the largest natural disaster to ever hit the planet that on a, you know, you yeah. know, in our time." And uh, man, that was tough. You know what I mean? I had just because when you're backpacking. Your relationship spans are, have to be a lot shorter. You, you become best friends with somebody overnight. You know For what I mean? 24 hours. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, I had just lost, like, 20s of people, you know? Holy shit. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people I knew, you know, were on the island when Kopi P got hit. You know, it didn't get hit by one wave. It got hit by about seven waves. Oh, Kopi P was remember. demolished. Demolished. It was about 10,000 people on the island. Do you think if about you were there, you would have been in the... Oh, I would have been gone. Mm. I, was, I, I was staying... Uh, uh, in the bungalows by PP Princess, so like okay, those, yeah, we had, those got wiped we had out. Pim, Pim on the podcast. I'm sure you yeah. must know Pim. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah. Exactly, okay. and I mean, and there's different, you know, there's different stories because the re the reservoir was right behind me, so it would have been out to sea or into the reservoir. Mm. You know what I mean? Like um, uh, back then, that wasn't all built up back there. Um, so, I, I mean, again, I, I think the ma majority of people that passed away passed away in their sleep. Right? They just got they, it, it. It happened yeah. so early. A lot of backpackers were there. They were probably retarded from the night before. And, uh, yeah, went, yeah, I went, mean, went to that, sleep and didn't wake up. That entire island was, uh, people don't understand. There's a couple movies on that, but they were com yeah. completely demolished. Devastating. Yeah, devastated. devastating. devastating. Uh, Airlifted out. Uh, Airlifted out. You know what I mean? I remember uh, my buddy Sammy Miami, who owns a bunch of resorts on Lipe and Cocodon and stuff, he was on the island at the time, and he left on the 730 boat. So he was on the ferry, on the Chowco ferry, and remember back then, everybody thought the tsunami was like a big wave. We were all thinking Japanese, you know, uh, Godzilla shows. Yeah. And so he's on the boat and they were like, a tsunami's coming. We're going to stop over at Kolong and we need you guys to all get off and run up the hill. Not knowing that the, the ferry had actually gotten raised up and the water had gone through. Are you with me? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the tsunami is what changed Holy my entire shit. life. I don't think I would be back here if it, if it wasn't for the tsunami. Um, I started doing a bunch of fundraisers. I went back to work. I knew, though, that I was going to come back here. And I, had, uh, I, I immediately bought a ticket and set the date for uh, March 9th, the day that Biggie Smalls died. I don't know why that's important to me. but mm. um, uh, And I came back, and I was one of the first for long back on the island around March 15th. At this point, were they rebuilding? Were you involved? Yeah, in so I got in touch with High PP. That was like the nonprofit organization that was there. But it also just that taught me a lot about nonprofits because, man, I raised a bunch of money. You know, like uh, I, ra I raised like over twenty grand USD, uh, and I brought it over there and I gave it to them. Which, in hindsight, I probably would have done things a little bit differently. What was that? The process is you go back home. It clearly it's hit. I mean. 
emotionally, you're probably a wreck at this point. Yeah. I mean, you basically, I mean, you dodged a bullet, let's yes. say. Yes. Um, yeah. How quick was that transition Transition of, I got to get back there and I'm going to get involved in, you know, raising money? I knew I was going to do it right away. Like, my mom even, like, we were, we were on the, you know, it was the 27th, 28th, it's Christmas holiday, but, like, all we were talking about was how I had just missed it and how we were, I was going to go back over and I was going to help out, and they were all, like, up for it, and we started doing philanthropy work and, and trying to help out and sending money over. The, 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 the interesting thing is, is I can look back at it, like, uh, you know, I built a gym out there that helped a guy who had lost his long tail and lost his kid and his wife in there and helped him get an income. But there were people that, like, I totally gave money to on the island because I'm from America and I think this is a third world country that just got ravaged. And these people probably have more money than I ever will have. I mean, the Because they're on the land. They own the land. Yeah. And, I mean, they own the, the leases on certain bars. You know what I mean? I worked for a reggae bar for years. Which the, one was that? The bar with the ring in the middle of it that they yeah, have, yeah. like, the fighting for buckets. Yeah. So Wina and Udom, like, they're great people. And Brian Jordan, who, again, is, like, another, like, ledge of Co-PP, if you will. Like, we all became very immediate friends. And, um, but there were definitely people that, like, I was helping out with money that totally didn't need the money. Mm -hmm. And, like, you saw where certain funds were going. And you also saw, like, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, like, the dark side of nonprofits, but, like, there are kids that travel to do it as a work holiday, but it's basically a vacation. 100%. And I mean, they don't really have any technical skills. Like nobody's a Mason here. Right. You know what I mean? So nobody's like putting bricks together. You know, I, I remember <clears throat> for a lot of the time that I was uh, working with IPP, which was like the month of March and the month of April, they basically used me as manual labor. You're a large human being. Could you push those bricks? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I can. But I mean, like I could also, I mean, again, like looking back to it, how did it need to be helped out? It needed to be helped out with more economic infrastructure. I, like I could have like built more the bar earlier. Like, yeah, man. You know, you know, more on like, you know, the project management side of it, let's say. Sure. Well, you also learn, you know, again, you, 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 you take 20, you know, young, dumb and full of cum high school, college students and you bring them over here and they're all going to want to socialize and they're all going to want to do that. And yeah, they might be spending their parents' money and yeah, they might be bringing, but if you actually have some people that can bring actual economic infrastructure to an island like Kobe P, you know, set up other dive shops, set up other tattoo parlors, set up other massages. There's only certain ways and certain businesses that are making it in Thailand anyway. I mean, I think Phuket even has like, it's only like four or five ways for expats to really, depending on how you want to earn, but like. Which is the benefit of a Muay Thai gym because it's not, it's seasonal, but it can survive in the low season. Sure. Right. And, but even those like, it, it, you know, I love the Muay Thai business, have you, have you spoken to Dr. Lynn Miller, by the way? She's been on the podcast. She's been on the yeah. podcast? Okay. Uh, like, so there's a lot of different people that think of it in different ways. You know what I mean? Um, I, uh, you know, I was on Kobe in 2004, but I was also here. I was fighting in Putong Stadium uh, quite a bit. I was fighting on Koh Samui. And, um, yeah, I was fighting on, on, on Kobe P. But, like, I was also there when Tiger Muay Thai was being built. Was a, was a hut. It was a hut. Mm. I was there when Rawai was, was one of the only ones. Phuket Muay Thai, you know, when you drive over and you're going to hit the green man from, from Kata mm. into Chilong, that was, the, Phuket Muay Thai was there on the right. That mm. was one of the original mm. uh, Muay Thai gyms on the island. Rawai was there. Sean Douglas, Will McNamara, uh, obviously Owen Barrett, who has Fight Lab. All those guys were getting together. And you could actually tell that, like, Falang were coming here now. The UFC by 2004 had picked up. Um, but I this is, that is there was no like with Tiger Muay Thai that MMA was just kind of getting started, but it's primarily Muay Thai. Yeah, at this point, I remember I remember uh, Sean Douglas did a, who who like really was one of the founders of Tiger Muay Thai. Sean Douglas at the old ba Bangla Stadium, which was on Bangla Road. <clears throat> I think he did the first MMA show there, and by MMA show I mean literally a guy in a gi mm -hmm. versus a guy in Muay Thai. Like it looked like. It was straight out of the old Still that, UFCs. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, and, and Hoist Gracie, you know. And it, like, exactly. Yeah. And it was like this practice of martial arts versus this practice of martial yeah. arts. I think he had a Taekwondo guy on there fighting a Muay Thai guy. And you know what I mean? And 
looked like one Wonder Boy against some. It, yeah. You know, it was just it's the beginning, the, the birth of MMA. It was the beginning. It without, was the beginning. Without the you know the, the terminology still did not exist for sure. When you were on PP at the, this point, two thousand three, and there's the rebuilding again. You're going back and forth. You yeah. said you're you're fighting here in, in Phuket. Did you have like a? I mean, you're obviously. Uh, coming back again and trying to get started, but did you have a roadmap or a plan in place? No. Because you've done, I mean, your story is quite uh, long as of where you are today. You've yes. owned bars at PP. Was there any roadmap? How did that process work? How did all this kind of come together over the years? Well, the beauty again, like we didn't have social media back then. So there was no comparing anybody and you didn't have, I mean, there wasn't YouTube. There was, I mean, I think, I think there was MySpace, but I wasn't on it. I remember even getting here. Like one of the reasons that man, so I like a little story for you. When I left uh, PP on the first one, I was good friends with a lot of like hip young Hollywood. I was very close with a guy named Garrett Headland. You know who he no. is? Garrett Headland was in Tron. He was the main guy in Tron. Uh, do you remember that movie? No. no? Tr Tron. Oh, Tron, Tron as in like, like Tron. Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So he's the main guy in Tron. Uh, Troy. He was in Troy. He yeah. was Patrick Lee's. He's the he's Brad Pitt's. Little little buddy that gets that gets killed. He was in Friday Night Lights, mm. Georgia Rule with like uh, Lindsay Lohan at the time. He was date he was dating Paris Hilton. At you know, mm. it's that time. Nobody was on an iPhone. They were all on Sidekicks, and I, like well, the Sidekick well, was the Nokia phone. Okay, it was like flipped up. Yep. Um, like the Razor almost. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the yeah. BlackBerry was big. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was totally like, uh, I I'm, I was I was friends with all these young cool Hollywood kids. My buddy DJ Catrona was 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 doing very well, and they picked me up um, a couple nights after uh, after I'd gotten back. They brought me to the Xbox 360 release party, okay. and I'm sitting there, and it's like Wilmer Valderrama playing um, playing Xbox with Snoop, and some dude came over and he was like, "Who are you here with?" And I was like, um, "I'm here with Garrett and DJ and like my boys over there," and they were like, "Oh, you're Turtle." And I was like, what are you talking about? And oh, they were like, you haven't seen Entourage? And I was like, no, I have no idea what the show Entourage is. And he was like, go see Entourage. You're Turtle. And then I remember seeing Entourage and being like, I am not fucking Turtle. What are you talking about? If anything, I'm Vinny Chase. You know what I mean? Like, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? And I just didn't like... That, that comparison. Yeah. Bro, I, you know, I had just been on an island with no cars. You know yeah, what I mean? I mean, Turtle's not... Turtle's like that laid back. He's very conservative. You know, no. oh, I'd love to be Turtle now. Yeah. You know, yeah. hey, hey, don't get me wrong. Nothing, nothing bad against Turtle. I'd love to be a Turtle now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, And I'd love to be a Turtle now. If you could put me in the entourage, I'll be n number nine, man. You know what <laughs> I mean? I, I don't care about any of that. Um, but it was just interesting because, like, being on an island with no cars and then going back to L.A. where everybody was like, what kind of car do you drive? And I remember, I remember some girl at the party. Like, I was, you know, throwing my lines out there. And she was like, you know, are you in... 90210 or 90212 are you in the valley and it's like dude i don't why am i talking to you like, I've been, I, I haven't existed in this reality in yeah. x amount of years and How so going back to going back to pp i mean i i didn't come with a phone like when you're asking is there a roadmap the the brilliance i think of being an expat and this still goes till today you can get into the whole social media game of comparing yourself but there's no comparison really among the expats like we're all mm -hmm. we're all on the side like what are you gonna what are you gonna do? Be a ladder climber in Thai society? No, it's it's very you know you kind of you got to make your own markets here and do your own thing. When when you were on PP, uh, I mean everyone will always ask the question for anyone living in Thailand. Like that's great, I'd love to live there, but how are you gonna make an income and how are you yes. gonna survive? Yeah. Um, did you kind of just take that day by day on decisions of as long as I can you know go hand to mouth month to month, or did you have any bigger ideas? Because you did own bars and you did you know do well in that side of the business. Um, I actually did really well, uh, like, I mean, I did very well uh, with real estate. Mm. So I was lucky enough to have a condo and have that type of stuff and making an income for me in L.A. And um, was able enough to take cash and buy a place down in Rawai when Rawai, and, you know, it's not like I'm a, uh, I am knew what I was doing. I, I had no idea. Um, but I remember being like, I want something that's not in Patong, I want something that's away from it. I want some place that doesn't have 7-Elevens. And back then, it didn't, you know? And um, I was able to buy a, a nice pool villa in Rawai and start keeping that rented out. What year would have that been? Uh, 2007. Okay, so way before, way before the real estate really real, started rocking. But that's the thing, because I got it in 2007. My, mo my mom looked at me like I was, you know, pretty smart, because 2008 happened in, in the States, and everything crashed. Yeah. 
And we luckily didn't sink our money in. You know, we were debating, I was debating like buying very crappy apartment complexes like outside of Philadelphia and that would have gone. Yeah, you would have, yeah, everything you know went I mean? belly up after that. Yeah. Year, so, which is basically happening now as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. Right? Yeah. So I think but but again, as the, you know, as the dollar rises, this is the first time. So like I have a, um, you know, I, I help out the CM Real Estate Boys. Big shout out to Patrick and Kevin and all those guys. Um, always tried to get some rentals moving. Tried to do tourism. Tried to do those things. Had the bar on Kobe P. Um, I've kind of experienced a lot of that. And, you know, some things didn't work out. And we're, I, I've never had any real huge financial failure. Nothing that I would consider like kicked me in the dick and I got to go back. Because, I mean, we can also remember right now while the, while the, <laughs> the short-term memory is, is at hand. Um, you, you remember the beginning of the, of the pandemic, everybody was into cryptocurrency and doing all the, all the other stuff. 2020, everybody yeah. was booming on crypto. And then when it, when it, I had so many people in Bangkok that were huge into crypto and all of a sudden, I don't know where those people are anymore. Like, and it's not saying that crypto is not, not there or any of those aren't smart, but like you could see expats during the pandemic go home. It was like, 10 here, 10 there, yeah. they, they're moving out now, these are moving out now. And anybody that didn't have a steady income or have uh, their yeah, well, people head on the shoulders, if you will. People just don't realize, like, they over, I mean, I, I do crypto, I do my own TA, I'm pretty good at that stuff. And they, get, they just get too caught up in all that yep. shit. It's very simple, there's one fucking chart you gotta look at, it's called yeah. the, D, the dollar index. If the dollar goes up, everything else in the world goes down. Yeah, That's it. Yeah. Everyone, oh, yeah, but have you checked the moving average and this? I'm like, no, it doesn't, none of it's relevant. Yeah. Just look at the, today the dollar is going to go, it's going to go to 120 on the index. The yeah. fucking bot is going to 40 and it's going to break it. I guarantee you by the yeah, end so of the year. I don't, again, like, uh, I, it was 44 bot to the dollar when I came here. I and, could see us going there. Yeah. It was 44 bot to the dollar in 2004. I loved it. The, the pound was up at like 56. Yeah. And I mean, I remember, you know, and again, beers were what, like 30 bot. You know, back then, you know, so you, you could go and be a the king for the evening, bro. <laughs> yeah, of course. It was, it, was, it was a wonderful time. Kobe P, I mean, there's got to be a movie that's made about that place. Well, that's they not did. The I remember Pim, uh, Pim was telling me that Macaulay Culkin was on the island. Yeah, and Seth Green. And there, but the, Callum was telling me that Macaulay Culkin was playing a character that Macaulay Culkin met on the island. And you might be familiar with him. Some guy that wore, like, bunny ear hats, and he was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Swede. Yeah. Yes. Um, she said that it was all based off, like, a character that he met while he, they were there. Yeah. My buddy Lorenzo was boys with that guy. And, like, yeah, I mean, dude, that place was all characters back yeah. then. And, I mean, again, they partied harder than rock stars. Like, like, we partied very, very hard during that time. And, I mean, it was it was all about that. It was How many and, years were you on PP? Like I had the bar until 2009. And uh, now, 2010. Was there a point in time where you just didn't leave the island for X amount of years? Yeah. Or were you coming and going? Uh, between 2008 and 2010... I like lived there full time for like a year. Jeez. I would do like a a day off here and there to go to Prompon and pick up booze, or go to Patong and just take a night off. But um, realistically, I was there. My I had like one of my best friends from growing up. This kid Phil Lindemuth. Um, he had traveled the world. He had lived in Australia and New Zealand and some different places. And he was asking me, and I was like, "Yo, come bartend." And he came, and like we just two peas in a pod got along. And at that time, you know, I was single. Swedish girls were like throwing themselves at you for yeah. jobs as well. I for mean, everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I mean, Kobe P was ridiculous. And your bar was time. dojo bar, right? The one yeah. with the buckets as you come in, there's uh, the tattoo parlors are all there. Yep. Dojo right in the center. There. Right. Near, yeah. Right yeah, in the yeah. center. So it, it, at, at the time we made, it was actually called uh velvet dojo. Okay. And how'd uh, you get, yeah. So that, that's probably an interesting story. Cause I mean, full metal dojo, dojo bar, the birth of the dojo. Yeah. Where did this name come from? Is there a much of a story to it or just, no, I, dude, I've always been into martial arts. Yeah. Dojo is that place. Also very much into film. I remember Boogie Nights. He was like, this is my dojo talking about his room. And I always thought it was funny that like I would have a bunch of dojos. I'm, I'm dude, I'm going to name three more things, the dojo and, and nothing's going to be an actual dojo. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, nah, just very much into that type of stuff. Hollywood, 80s, 90s action movies. I think that's probably what brought me to Thailand anyway in the first place was the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. Yeah. And, and oh, all he, the rest he was it. just here as well. I yeah, think. he was. Like a couple, maybe a month ago or so. I've met him a couple times. Yeah. He's a good dude. 
He's look. I mean, I didn't realize he's like sixty-two ish, but he looks. I mean, he looks phenomenal. Yeah. Who knows what they're? I mean, I'm sure that. See, uh, once I get to that, I've done the TRT, but I think that's the secret. That's the yeah. The, the elixir. And, I, and I'm gonna go. Uh, like I'm gonna wait. I don't know if you're waiting. I'm I, gonna I wait. did it once. Oh, sorry, twice. Oh wait, three times. Okay. Uh, but low dose cycles, and the problem with them is they fuck up your testosterone yeah. when you get off of it. Like, it never comes back. So yeah. it's like, now you're just like, well, I guess you need to be on this for life. And that's what a, a, a lot of the guys have said. They said, just don't do it till, like, you're 50, yeah, that's, and then do it till you're dead. Yeah, correct. That's it. That's that's my plan, I think. So <laughs> I'll, I'll wait until I'm in my yeah. mid-50s and then go with it from there. Have you, could you describe kind of the history of Phuket in terms of, like, the transition in the, I don't want to, it doesn't need to sound that, you know, like, large in that sense but like the transition of the backpacker and the evolution of the backpacker yeah. from the entire time you've been there and how have they changed how has pp changed because you basically uh, i think it's a fair point to say you've seen pp from the birth to what it is today well i mean the birth obviously had to start with like the beach and everything like that i know people that went there in like the 90s and i know and and obviously if you've lived there you know there's like four families that own the entire island and then there's one falong that has Le Cordon Bleu, and he was able to, like, get that back in the day for, like, a million baht, $30,000, and now it's probably worth, you know, a, yeah. a fortune, small yeah. fortune. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing about it is backpackers back in, the, in my day as an American, if I want to just completely paint them with one brush, it was all the mindful people. It was all the hippies. It was all the, you know what I mean? It, w it was the dudes that were open to yoga back in the early 2000s, late 90s, whatever it was. It wasn't yeah. raging at this no, point. Well, it, no, you didn't have. But the thing is, is no Americans come here. Not even many Canadians no, come true. here. Um, it's true. You know, Europeans. The, in, in June, it would be all the uni students from, like, Ireland and the UK, um, which was odd. Christmas, obviously all the Scandinavians, right? The Aussies come here all the time, right? They've been coming here since the beginning, you know? Yep. So I would just say that the evolution of the backpacker from what I saw was it went from being an actual backpacker to people that just wanted to experience vagabonding, you know what I mean, and that were up for trips. Because the new backpacker, let's face it, they have the, the shell case type of luggage and they wheel it around, you know what I mean? They're not even looking like the hippies that yeah, I used to make Almost glamping of. in a sense. Correct, yeah. you know? Um, and I mean, Phuket is an island... Kind of stayed the same. I, the ties always. If you were a guy, they thought you were going to be into whoring and or into the into the girls. And I don't I don't know why I'm using that phrase, but like ah, it's a fair statement. I yeah, think. yeah. Um, bar girls. Let's go with yeah. the bar girls. They always thought you were into the bar girls. They always pushed you to go to Patong. Um, and then, but there was these all these little small towns. Bung Tao and Surin was nothing, uh, nothing. Yeah. Um, uh, my Patrick's from CM Real Estate. His his father Richard had a had a bar up here in Surin, and I mean, uh, again, he was lucky to sell a couple beers a night, you know. Kamala was on the rise, but Kamala was on the rise for the people that were having their second or third vacation home, which it is now. Yeah, you know, I, Kamala I feel it's more like uh, it's, it's for the, the military vets. I feel sure. like when you go through there, because it's cheaper, you can go on a budget, and it kind of is catered to that age as well. Sure, uh, but like Talong and all that area, A is here, it's gra grabbing right. the pub. Okay, one sec, we got to... We got this dog. It's it's blind, and I don't trust her because she might fall down the stairs. So thank you, A. Take that dog away. Watch the cords. Okay. Oh, that's much better. She, I so think I'll probably so hear. Freeing. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So back back like pre. You're talking pre 2008. I mean, up here. I moved here in 2016 was in Taiwan in 2010, awesome. China, China 2011 till 16, and then moving up here. I moved here the day. Basically, the bulldozer ripped this down. Okay. I was up at that point in Lyon, and I was planning to, oh, I'll go check out those beach clubs. Showed up and just gone. Yeah. It's like, what the yeah, fuck happened that. here? This whole area up here, it's quite interesting. Like, the the whole bank, have you been out to, the, like, the, the new area of Bangtao Beach, the Easy Bar, yeah. Wave? That pretty much only really popped up during COVID. Oh, yes. That was it. And I, well, and Bang Tao you know, Muay Thai and MMA is That's, going to be a big boom for everybody there. Yeah. And everybody's going to come along there and it's going to make a, a nice little scene. Do you think it replaces the whole soy and chalong at a, no. at a, a point or that will never be replaced? I don't think that'll ever be replaced. Do you think it just like adds, you know, it's it's the next layer to that? It's like, like people saying, is Khao San Road going to be replaced? Mm -hmm. No, it'll evolve and it'll become a little bit more posh. 
But like the road has, I think, solidified itself as a, yeah. you know, again, when I, I, I had a piece of land there that I was renting on the soil over a rye and I was renting it for 7,000 baht a month and, and I could have bought it. I mean, there's a lot of shoulda, woulda, couldas in, yeah, yeah. in your Thai time. And I don't really live that way and I don't care, but you know, I had the land where Dragon Muay Thai is and that whole area. That, it was nothing. Like when I was running there and when I was fighting like off there. The, off the soy a bit. Yeah. yeah. It was all rubber tapping trees. There was nothing there. Um, I, I was there pre Puget Top Team. I was there pre Titan and pre Tonys, pre all of it. There was, there was nothing. You know what I mean? There was a few different houses and a few different. There wasn't a massage parlor. There wasn't a tattoo parlor. You know what I mean? How many guys like yourself still exist in, in Phuket in Thailand? Because you have to be an OG. Four of us. Like, now let's say over the years, maybe there was 30 to 50 of you. Yeah. How, and if we were to look at it on a bell curve and you're just watching them diminish away, not, not saying they're, they're dying or anything, no, just no, no. literally leaving. Um, was, would you be able to paint that picture at a certain point? Like, have you been seeing that drop off? And eventually, like, what, what do you see happening there? Is it... I think the expat community, I think like for Americans at least, I've, I've, I've read some, I, I remember reading somewhere sometime that like if you're an American and you stay out of the country for over a year, you generally don't go back. Mm. You know what I mean? And then there is the seven year itch, right? It happens in relationships, it happens in just life. And I think that a lot of expats hit a point where they're like, am I really going to do it? Because it, cause then it takes place like, am I going to have a family? You yeah. know what I mean? Am I going to do this? Do I want my kids to be educated here? Do I want them to have something else? You know, and you have to weigh out these these little parts of your life uh, as to, you know, what's best for you. When did um, that all click for you? Can you even remember, like, like was it a milestone time? I've always like, gone with the flow. I mean, I'm sure you've met other people. We have a lot of mutual friends. Yeah. I'm a very happy-go-lucky guy. I'm a pretty positive human being. I don't care about a lot of things that a lot of people focus their time on. Which, I, I mean, I have so many people contact me every day like, oh, you should do this and you should do that and you should do this. And it's like, oh, you should do that. I'm mm. cool. I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, but you've gotten to a point where you work with these people. Great. Like, How do you, uh, for a guy that's in content media and especially Full Metal Dojo and it's, yeah. so, it's extremely successful and it's, very, it's a very interesting promotion because a lot of the... Uh, uh, fighters that have come up to the UFC have probably had a fight on it at some point in their yes. career. Now... For a guy that's so heavily involved in content and media, but at the same time, it seems like you also distance yourself from the technology. How do you manage that? Uh, well, you just... And, and I'm saying it more yeah, from my you, experience you, because like... When the doors are closed, you run through them, right? I, I don't want to look at my Instagram anymore. I'm outsourcing it. Yeah. It's, like, it's literally about to drive me fucking mental. Yeah, I don't do it. Yeah. So you just outsource that and you won't even pick up yeah. the phone. I mean, you're doing the content. Like I, don't have, I don't have Facebook on my phone. I don't have... I, I have... Norbert, my my social media guy, and yeah. I'll, I'll I'll write content and I'll send him the pictures and stuff. But like scrolling does nothing for me. It's not, and, uh, and it was long number. ago, long ago that I remember. I mean, this doesn't have to do with the pandemic or influencers or anything. But I remember being somewhere looking at Facebook, and I was like, you know, again, I was probably on like Colipe or PP or something, having the time of my life, surrounded by friends. And I would see like a picture of people like, you know, in New York at a dive bar. And I'd be like, oh, I really want to go to the dive bar. No, you don't. You don't. Yeah. You're, you're living the dream. You're like on the island. You don't want to go to a shit dive bar in, in, in Brooklyn. You yeah. know what I mean? But what social media does, is it obviously puts that illusion in front of your head that you compare yourself and you want to do that. And you, and you think that you want to be someplace else. When to tell you the truth, if you were just doing a little bit of mindfulness, you'd realize that you, you've got it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in the mix you're, you're living the dream are you, so, are you practicing anything such as like yoga meditation to stay grounded on that oh I'm a pretty mindful guy anyway yeah. um, I still kick pads all the time I still do a little bit of kung fu um, practice a little tai chi sit alone mm -hmm. so I, you know I, I do do some of that stuff but I mean no to tell you the truth like in terms of um, I've been fortunate enough where I never really went a corporate route so I never which is a that's a gift and a curse. That's a double-edged sword. Because, like, even, like, when I was working with Fox, for example, like, that's the most corporate structure that you could have. But I, it was my company that was getting hired by Fox to promote content and produce content. Mm -hmm. So I never actually had, to, had a, like, a boss. I had a dude that gave me deadlines, but I never had anybody that was, like, over me 
Yeah, I'm following a certain, you know, being politically yeah. correct. And, and I never had to go through any of, like, the ladder climbing <clears throat> or stepping on anybody's head to get higher or using another human being to get to a larger place. Did, you know what now, I mean? a stepping when, stone. When you were working with Con Fox and doing that content, um, was there a gap between Thailand and that and you coming back and forth? Or how, no, how, no. how did that all kind of come together? Okay, so, um, you know, we, we, we started up... With a, I started doing a the first like pro MMA show. Okay, so the first pro MMA show in Southeast Asia was probably Martial Combat mm -hmm. in Singapore, and it had a lot of the guys that I used, a lot of the guys that won championship. Uh, wh used. What, what year was that? Just for two thousand nine, two thousand ten, um, and then Dare Fight Sports in two thousand ten. We did the first one in Bangkok that was like in a cage. That was sure dog or tapology, mm -hmm. you know, regulated. When when um, you say we is is this like the your the team you're working with, team you're that I was working with. and you're producing the content because they've reached out to you to no it was uh, so there was a a couple Finnish guys uh, it, two in particular Yane and Josie they were the like the artists behind and the promoters behind they had done a show in Finland they knew that they wanted to do MMA um, they just like me and just like everybody back in 2010, we're like, why aren't the Muay Thai guys transitioning? Why aren't they transitioning? Like, these guys could be making so much more money at a higher level. They could be traveling the world. Um, but also, that's like a, a very closed-minded way of looking at it because it's like saying, like, why is the rugby player trying to go to the NFL? Mm. Or You know what I mean? Like, just because he could play cricket doesn't mean he, mean he could play baseball. Yes. You, know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's very cultural. It's very much where, where people, like, people always ask, Ask me why doesn't Borkow fight MMA? And it's like, why would he fight MMA when he's making enough money and he's happy and he's an icon and he's he's getting paid loads of money to fight cans? You yeah. know, if you offered me, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to fight Mike Tyson or a hundred thousand dollars to fight an eighth grader, yes, there are some people in the world that were like, yeah, well, I want to fight Mike Tyson. I, I'll go kick the shit out of a couple of eighth graders and, yeah. and stack those, <laughs> stack those <laughs> stack that those body dollars. count yeah, for sure. So. Um, we did Dare Fight Sports. Dare Fight Sports kicked off, and one th and then one championship kicked kicked off. They, like those guys were actually at our show. Yeah, um, and they did it at a at a whole other level. But I remember being like, again, like they're they're very corporate, and they and their ideas were very corporate. And and even back then, he was like, it's going to be us here and them there, and and um, you know. They've done fantastic. Certain things have come to fruition. Certain things haven't. I don't have any. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of what they do. I'm a bigger fan of it now than I was back then. Um, and yes, Full Metal Dojo and Dare Fight Sports were actually like the preempt to anybody that's been on one. Like I've definitely sent the most people to one championship of any promotion. And But, you know, a lot of people refer to us as a feeder league if you're in the industry. I don't really consider myself anything. Like this was a slice of entertainment. I knew that I wanted to produ produce and direct live shows. I knew that I wanted to produce uh, things for television. I also knew that I loved events coordination. I've always been into events coordination, whether it's setting up a party at the dojo on PP, setting, bu setting up a, a house party. We used to throw fights in villas, dude. Yeah. We used to, like, I'm the real bad guy. I'm real Mr. Han. Like, I, I was the one that was doing, when people are like, what are the underground fights? Bro, we were fucking renting out villas and, and setting up stuff. I was Dutta 5000 or, or Kimbo Slice. Around the same time, you know, um, we were doing shady shit. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I'm um, sure there, there's a lot of that going at Southeast Asia. I mean, oh, of course. I mean, this is the Hong Kong the, has the, it. The birth of, uh, I mean, we got cockfighting here for yes. a reason. So, uh, yeah. Right. And there's some real human cockfighting going down, <laughs> too. So, what was the birth of Full Metal Dojo? One championship was getting bigger, and they were picking off a lot of the people that we were working with, with Dare. And I don't think at that time I really recognized how much capital was needed, and I wasn't going to go out and raise that capital. So, like, promotions can survive on, on different things, and different, they're just different business types, different business models, right? And I think everybody now really knows that uh, that one championship is going after that tech, become the, full, the, the Facebook, get the, get the people, and then unleash the subscription. And, and I, th I mean, he's going to try to IPO, and, and he, he's going to go that route. Um, you know, what, uh, UFC was fifty million dollars in the hole, right? Their their story is famous. Yeah, this is like two thousand nine, ten, yeah. eleven. Type I think thing. I'm actually the I think I'm the lo longest running MMA promotion that's private, one hundred percent privately owned. When would the the year? So of I the broke kickoff? away from 
I broke away. So Dare was getting, you know, there were people that were getting hired by other organizations. There were other organizations popping up and picking off people. So there was a lot of internal struggles. A lot of the fighters were coming to me and they were like, yo, I was promised this and they're not delivering. And I was the face of the organization. So I was catching a lot of the flack. And then I had a couple dudes came in and they were like, yo, you can do this on your own. You can do this on your own. And I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty because like, it's not like I wish uh, that I could go back to Dare. I just wish we were a little bit more open with each other because I didn't know the financial stresses of the show that they were under. And we were still trying to like get sponsors on board, get on TV. But I was like, I, I've just been told that I can do it myself. And I have these people offering me cash. Mm. And so I broke away from Dare, which was the downfall of Dare. Super bummer, because I do think the best mixed martial artist or the most artistic human being ever in mixed martial arts was this guy, Yanni Rasmus, from Finland. If you look at, at the D.A.R.E. fight stuff, if, you, if anybody goes back and checks out our, our artwork for D.A.R.E., you'll then see the UFC come out with very similar posters. I mean, before D.A.R.E. fight sports, there was never a, a fight poster that didn't have a fighter on it, right? Pre-2010, really? dead serious. Like, and, and again, there, there could be some fight holic out there that's like googling right now and looking at it but pre dare every fight poster that ever existed was the stereotype of the old carny you know two dudes yeah. like this all of the old ufc fight posters pre-2010 go look at them they're all gonna be like somebody standing you know hoist gracie was on the poster even the original poster with the old dude you know the art davy days yeah. where the guy's standing you had all the fighters dare fight sports came out we didn't have any fighters on our posters we were doing posters like, like movie po posters, real film-oriented posters. If you go look at the Joe, we had Joe Ray fight Ole Larson, and that's where all your Tiger Muay Thai, Bung Tao guys, mm -hmm. that's where we started becoming boys, was Joe Ray fought Ole Larson in Insanity Nightclub, super underground. We had, we had no weight classes on that. We had Moist Rimbaum fight a guy named Locomotive with, with uh, Maribek Tysimov in his corner. So there was loads of dudes that are in the UFC now that were at that show. And that show was buck wild. I mean, it was a rated R show. I was allowed to yell fuck like every other word, you know what I mean? <laughs> Bring the motherfuckers in here. And uh, it was just really, really in your face. And um, if you look back at those posters, like there's a poster of Joe Ray's face with the sirens in the background. So he has like a light that's shining blue and a light that's shining red. And I think it was maybe... Four months later, that GSP was fighting Michael Bisbing, and they're captured in blue and red, and it, it, mm. all of it looks very much. I, I feel like again, in in terms of artistic creativity, it's my guys and my teams that have been knocked off the most. We've been we were influencers in the industry before there was the term influencer mm -hmm. in the industry, and everybody's used us. And again, I don't mind being a feeder league because I'm not going to pay the fighters what they probably feel they deserve um, or what other people think that they deserve. I think that that business model, I don't like, it's not actually proven mm -hmm. to be profitable. Do, the, the full metal dojo, when you, when you're putting this uh, promotion together, I yeah. mean, uh, we have the circus side, we have the jungle viewpoint. Yeah. We have, I mean, you're having uh, bo there was boxing yes. or sorry, Muay Thai in Rao. Why you were running last week. Oh yeah. Can, can you explain more to the audience that might not be familiar with them? If there anyone's watching from Canada, to the U S because most of us in Thailand, we understand it. What are these different buckets and categories of full metal dojo in some of your fight cards and promotions? How would you describe them? Well, I mean, I, I fell in love with originally like the stadium Muay Thai and I, I was one of the first Falang announcers to ever do like I, I did Bangla when it was at the old Bangla. I did Sinemian Road for years. The uh, guy named Mark Diamond. Um, that's how I started learning Thai. Like like a lot of Falang that come here, Thai isn't ne isn't necessarily a priority. Um, me learning Thai was learning how to do Yokti Nung, Yokti Song, Yokti Sam, and going into that. I, I can sing the King's Anthem. I can sing all of those, and that's from being at the shows. So I was really, really into like the stadium, and um, uh, which I got to go back to during the pandemic. Um, Full Metal Dojo started in 2014. I think our, I think the, like the prime years for mixed martial arts in in Southeast Asia, probably around 2017, 2018. One was doing well. Malaysian Invasion was in effect. There was a Rebel, uh, U UGB, uh, URCC in the Philippines. Cambodia was kicking off. Myanmar was finally like getting into it um so around that time it was it was good um 
listen, there's a, like, there, there are games that are played. There are politics, and I just really kind of stayed at, out of them. I think if I had played politics, I could be at a higher level and probably making a little bit more money, but I'd also have a boss. I'd also be part of a group. There wouldn't be any Full Metal Dojo. Yep. Are you with me? Yep. Um, you know, I've, I've had offers to go work. There are a lot of people that are in the fight game that want to work for the UFC. I guarantee you, you don't. If you're a guy like me, you don't because they only hire 27-year-old women who aren't fans of the sport. Why do they do that? Because that's the best for the corporate structure. You don't want a bunch of fanboys running around Conor McGregor, right? You want a bunch of 27-year-old girls who don't know who he is, don't care who he is, and watch Sex in the City, yeah. right? Because they get the job done, right? So it, it, it is a corporate, corporate structure, and I personally have decided as an expat that I'm not really going to live that life. I'm going to, uh, you know, do, write yeah, my own narrative yeah, are and, you, and, and do things my own way. And again, especially have the family time that I wanted to have. You know, my dad... Uh, when I was growing up, I didn't see my dad a lot, and I, un and I understand why I didn't. That was the day and age of the 80s where he needed to work and crush it out of the park so he, he could send me to a good school, right? Well, you don't really need the good schools anymore. Uh, the learning is online. You don't really need to go to school. You really need Unless to you're going to be an engineer, a doctor, maybe a lawyer. Correct, or go into some trade. <laughs> right. Right? You don't, need so, you don't need to go to school for business admin, let's right. be honest. So personally, I find it, like I have a five-year-old boy, like I need to spend time with my kid. So, I mean, like, I get, to, I get to bring my kid to school every day. I get to bring, I pick him up from school every day. I spend time in the pool with him every day. I throw him around. You know what I mean? Like, he comes and kicks pads with Petzilla. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, that's the life that I wanted to have. I, also, like, I, I traveled so much between 2010 and 2020 that in 2019, I was, pre-pandemic, I was thinking of ways of not going, you know, yeah, Everywhere. when I talked to you once, I think you're just pre like pre pandemic ish, and I think you were going to the U.S. or coming back for some yeah. uh, filming as well. Are, are you still doing that? Or are well, you kind of like? Well, how that originally got in though was I got I got uh, I got in with a, a team in Bangkok that was a bunch of fixers, and um, I got hired by Vice, mm. and so I did the prison fight. So when I did prison fight, which obviously took off, and that's like one of the highest viewed Muay Thai associated films on a. Uh, uh, that's when like doors started opening to me and people were like, yo, do you want to produce this? Or do you want to write this? Um, I worked with coconuts mm -hmm. uh, and all those guys. I did prison fight for coconuts. I helped out with the, the showtime prison fights. Um, you know, so like I was doing all of that stuff at the same time I was working for again, Kunlun in China. Um, there are certain organizations that make you work for them solely and, and you're, you're signed on and you're one of the team and you can't work with anybody else. I was fortunate enough, I feel like, to work for all of them. I was working for Malaysian Invasion and Singapore Fighting Championship. And, and did, did they give you creative autonomy, or do you kind of have to follow up? As a, an MC, a, they did. Okay. As a commentator, they did. Uh, as a producer, you know. They got a template. People, people want theirs a certain way, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and again, I've gotten to see them all rise and all fall. A lot of the, uh, almost all the organizations that I worked for uh, throughout Southeast Asia, most of them are gone, you know, mm. um, have gotten acquired by other people or, or sucked up or whatever. And then, I mean, really, uh, I started doing a lot more documentary stuff with my buddy Andy Whitelaw, started working for Fox as a pundit in 2000s, late 2016, early 2017. Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. I was flying to, flying to uh, man, there, there was a bunch of people that worked for the UFC that were out here. Fox didn't want a UFC guy. They wanted a guy that could speak live on camera for two minutes. And one of the things that I'm very good at is speaking fluently on camera for an initial amount of time. Like, if, if you want me to do 47 seconds right now, I could literally just do, you know, like, here at the Fruiting Body Podcast, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We're getting it done. This is what's happening. Yeah. That's what's happening. And I, and, and I can roll. So I got hired by Fox to go do the lives. Mm -hmm. And they were flying me down every Tuesday to do the pre-shows for whatever the weekend was, you know. And at that time, remember, that was the Conor McGregor era. Like, I was the one for Fox that got to do Conor Mayweather. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that got, and by the way, because I had the connection to Conor already through, you know, my buddy Audi Attar from UCLA, Go Bruins. Um, oh, whoa, whoa, easy now. Easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, we, that was, that was just a great time. And Andrew Whitelaw and I pitched a show. Um, and this will bring us up to the pandemic. We pitched a show called, uh, it was called Eat, Pray, Fight first, and they changed it to Eat, Play, Fight because they wanted more activities. 
and we signed with them and Chang Sport and Chang Beer, TCC Tai Bev, um, in 2019. And so I was going to kick off like, man, it was, it was going to be so I'm – I'm a great COVID casualty story. When anybody bitches about, like, losing everything during COVID, I'm like, you have no fucking clue. Because we signed, like, the biggest deal of my life to be, like, the Anthony Bourdain – of Asian MMA and they were going to travel me around the world at all these different fight shows and the fight shows were doing so well that um, in 2020, January 2020, uh, they sent us to cover McGregor, Donald Cerrone and the show did so well that Chong wanted me to start crossing over from combat sports and do other things. So in March 24th of 2020, I was supposed to go cover, cover Leicester City versus Manchester United. Yeah. As a big septic tank yank, a guy that doesn't play soccer, a guy that has nothing to do with football, I was going to go, like, be in the mix. It was going to be so awesome. Um, and we had six other episodes that were around. I was going to go to Italy. We were going to go to, like, Slovakia. Was this coming back to fruition or? No. No. The whole show got furloughed for a contract of two years. Oh, fuck. And in that two years, it got lost. Yeah. But also, I mean, like, I didn't sit. Like, I love... My little COVID story is fantastic because we signed uh, for Eat, Play, Fight, a bunch of episodes. We were going to crush it. March happens. It all goes to hell. I feel like most of the world sat down and watched Netflix, ordered in, watched Tiger King. Started That's, a podcast. Started a podcast. <laughs> there was See, again, like you were motivated. You got off. I got, Although you got onto the couch, yeah. you got off the couch. Uh, you know, it's just you had more time on your hands and you had the option. Am I just going to be a fat ass and yeah. sit on my couch or now I got time to go do something? So I, I really got off my ass too and started hustling. And I was like, I know I'm not going to be able to do Full Metal Dojo shows because we had, to, we had to deal with Fox. A lot of people don't understand this, but there's a huge break in the chain in MMA because Fox and ESPN joined forces and WME, IMG Group and Disney... That's all like under one umbrella and, and the UFC is under that too. So we used to get cash and it would be like, yo, can I get some cash for it to do a show? Well, now we have the UFC content. Can you compete with the UFC content? Mm. And then Bellator's over at Paramount, which switched over, you know, the Spike TV. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the fighters don't understand. There's this huge break in the chain, you know? And then uh, you have Sky thrown in the mix where they're just, they're and showing DAZN. everything for free. Yep. And his own. Yeah, and, and, well, and the I, same I mean, thing. I mean, Sky, like, for example, if you're in the UK, you don't pay for yep. pay-per-view. BT, just all of B it. BT Sports. Yep. You just taught. 100%, bro. Well, do you know, why, why is that, or how did that, how, how does How did Americans get conned into it? Yes, correct. I don't know. How did Americans get conned into, like, well, I mean, it, it has to do with the wealth, though, right? And, and, and once you start getting used to something, you don't mind it. But, I mean, fellow Americans, stop doing pay-per-views. They'll all go to free. But, I mean, that's not how it will work. Again, Bridges will crash. Things will, like, again, I personally, I love like the Will Chopes of the world who are doing TFCs. Mm -hmm. I love legend that's stepping up. You know, I, I was one of the guys that got MMA banned in Thailand, right? And I, I should be one of the guys that people look to to try to have it be regulated. How or, did, what do you mean? How did you get it banned in Thailand? 2013, we did a show that was like so big and did so well uh, in Bangkok that the sports authority... We weren't under a sports authority at that because they don't at call a, it a sport. Uh, sanity and insanity, insanity. Yeah, yeah. we made new, major newspapers around the world because we were actually using very high level fighters at that time. Was that uh, no? I had Glenn Sparv on episode yeah, Glenn, two. Was he boy. on one of those cards? Yeah, he was on one of those cards. I, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Um, he was. He was. He was my first main event. Yeah, he was literally on episode two. Okay. Yeah. yeah great <laughs> mullet. Best mullet in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Super good guy. His brother. You know his brother, right? Yeah, he's a soccer player. Like a yeah. soccer star. Uh, for Finland. Yep, for Finland. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Glenn's the man. But, like, they basically banned us. But just as we're talking about gray areas in Thailand, it was a gray area. Nobody actually banned us. There was no legitimate law. Mm -hmm. It was the sports authority saying that you're banned. But I was fine with being like, yo, I'm not under the sports authority anyway. You don't consider it a sport. And, by the way, my, my looking at it as a sport over the years, but whether it's a sport or an entertainment, I mean, now I look at it, it's a one-night contest. The rankings don't mean crap. UFC has almost like proved that the rankings don't really mean yeah. crap. So it's really just a one night contest. I don't really consider it a sport. I consider it entertainment. I but consider by, it all entertainment. By you getting it banned, wouldn't that have helped push it getting regulated? Oh, uh, that helped me. Yeah, that helped me. Because someone's gonna have to get that regulated at a point. I'm assuming Thailand or the Thai government, whoever's banning it, it's more. Hey, wait a minute. This could be a competition for our bucks coming out of, of Muay course. Thai. That's, that's probably that's what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. It was just let's stop that in the tracks right now. Right. 
Yeah. And I mean, again, like I would, they, they, it's not a woulda, shoulda, coulda, uh, or, or a, I told you so, but I told you so, told you so. Like you guys could have had so many more people go to higher levels if you had uh, had gotten into it sooner. What's the um, landscape now in Thai? Let's say more specifically, uh, yeah, Thailand for MMA. What is the like in terms of competition promotions? What's it looking like today, post pandemic? Well, I think it's it's going to be really tough. It's going to be really, really, really tough because um, you have a lot more competitors that want to get into it. You know, I mean, I remember, I remember pre-pandemic and, and right at the pandemic, people saying that it was going to crush Muay Thai, right? Pandemic didn't crush Muay Thai. It made more poor people. And poor people are the backbone of Muay Thai. You know, mm -hmm. I remember somebody being like, oh, the bar girls are going to be gone. Like, there's not going to be any more. Eh, it might have pushed them online. It might be more on Tinder now. Right, but if anything, there's going to be more bar girls because mm. more people are poor and they don't want to work. Society's also changed so that people don't want to get jobs. You know, people want to be dependent on something, and and uh, you know, which to and each their own. But like you know, uh, again, these little gray areas. What do I think the landscape is? The reason I say it's going to be tough is because there's only a certain amount of TV outlets. If you want to do a show like a, a real. Um, MMA show, Muay Thai show, boxing show. It doesn't really matter what it is. And you don't have a broadcast deal, it's very tough to break even. So you got to be willing to lose money. Like, don't follow my path. Like, don't do it. I don't believe anybody could, could do it. Um, and the, and the, one major reason why a lot of people can't do my path is because I direct my own show and I MC my own show and I produce my own show. Yeah, All so your overhead time. is very minimal in that right. sense. Yeah. Right, And Like, Bruce Buffer has never gone in and, like, like done his lines and then be like, now switch to camera one, switch to camera two. Yeah. And now we're entering the fight. You I know what this, I mean? I did the same thing at Muay Thai Mushrooms and I don't, I didn't even remember watching a fight. I ran right. around. The entire time. The whole time. And people are like, did you watch a fight? I'm like, not one second. Yeah. I'm like, I tried to direct cameras and it was, I didn't care. It definitely, we haven't even finished editing. Yep. The one guy left. We'll, we'll get at it. It's one of those things one day. But, um, I, I totally understand for a guy like yourself. Like, I was drenched in sweat. Yeah. And we only were there for two, three hours. Yeah. I know that I changed, like, three times during the show. It's insane. like, why are you changing? And I'm like, because I'm raining. Yes. It's raining in the John Nutt rainforest. Yeah, it's you know, fucking um, nuts. Okay, guys, this went a bit longer than expected, but, you know, it was an absolute legendary podcast. It was amazing. So much information of what's going on at Full Metal Dojo, their upcoming fights and events. So this is a two-part episode this is part one it is going to air well if you're watching it, it is tuesday around 6 p.m bangkok time the second episode will be on thursday also at six at 6 p.m so stay tuned for that